and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. This week we look at the latest Metal Gear Solid game, Peace Walker. The good. Plus, cuddly toys get violent in Naughty Bear. The bad. And the latest Transformers games for 360 and Wii. Bajo, if you say the ugly, I'm going to cut you up into chunks and feed you to Megatron myself. Didn't even cross my mind, Hex. We also meet the guys behind Beached As, but first, can you guess the game for this week? And I believe it's officially your turn to read the news this week, Hex. Damn right it is. Yeah. So you're totally rubbish and get there on time last week. Oh, that spacey hurts. Good game! Online activities are increasingly being cited as evidence in divorce cases in the US. According to the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, over 80% of its members have dealt with evidence from sites such as Twitter, Facebook and MySpace. American lawyers are now actually requesting play logs from World of Warcraft to prove that sneaky spouses have been indulging in virtual dalliances. The rate of social media being involved in divorces has exploded in the past five years and it appears to be a worldwide trend. The British website Divorce Online reports that one in five divorce petitions include the word Facebook. Veteran game designer Peter Molyneux has spoken out to ensure the world that Milo and Kate isn't just a tech demo. After words from Microsoft's Aaron Greenberg on Good Game that it wasn't a product they planned to bring to market. According to Molyneux, it really is a full game and it's still in development at Lionhead. Originally revealed to demonstrate the potential of the Kinect motion sensing add-on for the Xbox 360, Milo and Kate simulates a 12-year-old boy who can sense your posture and facial expressions and respond with his own simulated personality. Molyneux expressed his frustration at trying to convince the execs at Microsoft that Milo and Kate will deliver on all of its gameplay promises and promises to reveal more about the game soon. Roger Ebert has made a partial back down from his controversial statement that video games are not art and can never be art. The elderly American film critic has now admitted on his blog that he was foolish to make this assertion, considering that he has next to no experience at actually playing video games. The sum total of his gaming experience consists of dabbling briefly with mid-90s puzzle adventure games such as Myst. While conceding that gamers may consider interactive software to be art, he has no intention of finding out for himself. Ebert just doesn't have gaming in his blood and has vowed to stick to books and movies for the rest of his days. Good game. What's wrong, Bajo? Can't remember how to turn on my PSP. <sighs> yes, it's been a super long time since we've had a top PSP game, but that changes this week. There are a handful of gaming franchises which have managed to become almost mythological in the way that they're revered. Metal Gear Solid is one such series. Oh, it's not charged. This is a direct sequel to Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. It's 1974 and Snake has set up a humanitarian mercenary force called Militaire Sans Frontières. That's Soldiers Without Borders for the non-French speakers like myself. Hey. Professor Galvez comes from Costa Rica's University for Peace. Snake and his cohorts wind up in Costa Rica, helping a professor and his 16-year-old charge, Paz, kick the CIA out of the country and save the world from a Metal Gear hell-bent on launching a nuke. It's one of the best stories in the franchise so far. I'm gonna have to stop you there, Hex, because the story may be good, but the script is just so horribly overwritten that every cutscene takes way longer than it needs to. One of the early ones contains one bit of information and one bad joke, and it takes over seven minutes to get all that out. <laughs> Do it for the girl. For pause. You just don't seem to get it, Badge. The long-winded cutscenes and dialogue are great. I mean, it's all tongue-in-cheek, and at times it's deliberately awkward. It's like listening to old friends talking crap. And I know what that's like. Pleased to meet you, Paz. Call me... Kaz. Uh. I really dug Metal Gear Solid 3, but none of them have really pulled me right to the end, and it's not for a lack of trying. I just, just don't get the appeal. Well, I get it, and in Peace Walker there's sneaking, base building, shooting, a hell of a lot of cutscenes, and I think it's one of the best Metal Gear games so far. It's also one of the biggest. You're right about the game being big. There's 17 hours here just in the main campaign, and then there's heaps of optional side missions where you can obtain new recruits and upgrade your gear and skills. The main story missions will be immediately familiar to anyone who's played a Metal Gear game before. There's lots of sneaking, learning patrol routes and tranquilizing, in between some rather epic boss battles. 
I'd call the boss battles more frustrating than epic hex. It's just, they're set around co-op, you know, at two or four player difficulty. So when you go solo, the difficulty isn't lowered. There is definitely a very steep difficulty curve in this game, but I felt it really came alive when playing with a friend. Players can help each other climb, so having more than one player often opens up new routes in a level. You can also revive a fallen comrade. Co-op is a nice addition, especially in the boss battles, but there's no infrastructure mode here, so you can't take it online, and I just wonder how well that will do in Australia. Mm. Uh, much of the design of Peace Walker seems to be based around Monster Hunter. I mean, the map design is all but identical, and co-op works much the same. Monster Hunter is incredibly popular in Japan, as is ad hoc PSP multiplayer, but here, not so much. One of the strangest features of the game is the Fulton system, a kind of balloon-assisted skyhook that can be used to remove unconscious soldiers from levels and transfer Transport them to the mother base for indoctrination into MSF. Yeah, it's kind of like Pokemon, but with far more drugging and brainwashing. Gotta kidnap them all! These kidnapped soldiers can then be put to work in mother base. Each new recruit can be placed in a different team, combat, R&D, mess hall, clinic or intelligence. Each of these teams is vital to the efficient running of MSF. Combat teams bring in cash, R&D use that cash to build or upgrade gear, mess hall keeps everyone fed, the clinic heals the wounded and intelligence gathers intelligence. You can manually assign your dudes to do different tasks or you can automate the process as well and what you can build depends on the levels of your team and also what blueprints you find out in the field. Later in the game your combat teams can be sent out on mercenary missions. These aren't playable except for being able to assign which soldiers go out on each mission. Successful missions will bring back new recruits or plans for new gear. I found no matter what the situation Hex, I was always just fighting with the controls. There are three control setups, Hunter, Action and Shooter. Both Hunter and Action use the D-pad for camera control, meaning that you can't control the camera whilst moving. I definitely thought the Shooter setup was the best all round, but I, I agree with you, you know, even that had its drawbacks. The camera control with the face buttons was pretty twitchy, so it, it made aiming a bit of a hit and miss affair. No pun intended. Oh, I get it. There is an auto-aim that you can turn on by pressing select, but it seems to just lock on to inconsequential things or randomly just spin the camera around, and I think it's because the, the distance for lock-on is remarkably short. One thing I think we can both agree on is that the game just looks gorgeous. I mean, the engine is great, and, and the stylish cutscenes are just beautiful. Nice cigar, huh? Definitely. The major cutscenes are this cross between traditional Japanese paintings and comic book. Yeah, plus a lot of the cutscenes are interactive. Some contain little quick time style events like having to shoot down unmanned drones. While others just give you the chance to zoom. Unfortunately, sometimes the ability to zoom is a little bit creepy. Somehow she managed to escape. Oh, my God. So what did you think, Bajo? I didn't hate it, Hex. It all works technically and it's a good looking game, but I feel like it's a game made just for Metal Gear fans, and if you're not one already, I don't think this is a game that's going to pull you into the franchise. So I'm giving it 7 out of 10 rubber chickens. I think Peace Walker is a fantastic addition to the series. It's vintage Metal Gear with a host of new features and excellent co-op. I'm giving it 9. When Naughty Bear came along with its cute and cuddly teddy bears turned macabre machete wielding serial killers, I thought, well, hey, this could be some quirky fun. But oh, how wrong I was, Bajo. How terribly, terribly wrong. Yes, Naughty Bear tries its hardest to combine clever parody with classic destructive gameplay. Think cute and fluffy bears in the Teletubby esque environment, all trying to beat the crap out of each other with baseball bats and legs of hemp. The idea of it sounds like it might be hilarious with a kind of, you know, GTA 4 mow them down mentality, but Hex, I don't even know where to begin with just how wrong this game gets it. Well, I do. I mean, the fact is, it's just not funny. It's mm. stupid. Mm. I mean, I know they're trying to parody a children's program or something, but that doesn't stop that voice from being horribly patronizing and annoying. Who's this? Oh, look, it's Naughty Bear. Hitting things is pretty naughty. Oh, goody, a gun. Guns are marvellously naughty. Naughty! The whole thing is executed poorly and it doesn't even get close to being fun. 
Yeah, I agree. There are seven episodes in the game, each with several chapters that offer different, equally annoying challenges, all set pretty much in the same limited area. Friendly challenge! Don't fight them! You get points for destroying objects in the world, killing other bears, or just scaring them, setting traps, and stopping them from escaping or calling for help. But the controls are clunky and unresponsive, and Naughty Bear himself just feels so clumsy to maneuver. The camera swings around him constantly, and as you get close to another bear, you just find yourself thrashing about and spiraling in awkward circles. Yeah, for a game whose sole function is to destroy and kill everything, it's baffling that they could get the controls so wrong. You'd think that at least this simple function of the game could at least operate well, amidst the complete lameness of the concept on which some pathetic excuse for a story is carelessly tossed. Basically, Naughty Bear made a gift for another bear's birthday. They all laughed at him and thought it was stupid, and that turned him into a psycho killer and sent him on a killing rampage. Yeah, it's just stupid and repetitive. Every single time I had to smash some random household items or break a window, the stupid game was telling me how naughty I was, and all that made me want to do was throw the controller out the window. Yeah, and if that's not bad enough, the game is littered with bugs. Mm. It crashed at the end of the third episode three times in a row, and then when I got a new copy of the game, it crashed again on a loading screen. You know when you're crashing in a loading screen, you got issues. <laughs> By the time I was game enough to attempt the online multiplayer, I must have waited 15 minutes for someone else to join my game, and when that finally happened, the lag was so terrible that I got booted within the first five seconds. And that was the end of that. As you progress, you unlock more chapters and a variety of hats for Naughty Bear, each with a few buffs to give you that edge. But challenges in each episode were just variations on the same bear-killing, window-smashing formula. The whole thing was a tedious, horrible chore to play through. There was the odd moment where I cracked a smile at some of Naughty Bear's more innovative approaches to murder, but they were few and far between. If Naughty Bear has taught me anything, it's that destroying random objects in a fire is apparently hilarious. I think this is the worst game I've ever played. I'm giving it one out of ten rubber chickens because it's a game and I played it when it worked. I'm giving it one and a half because mine didn't crash as much as yours. Out of ten. Good game. It's hard to believe it's been two years since a beached whale with a funny accent washed ashore on our internet. Beached as started its life as a viral video, was watched by millions, has its own TV show, and now a game. When it comes to telling the story of Beached As, I think each of us has a different story to tell. My understanding of it is that uh, it sort of stems back to, to, to preschool almost. Or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mac and I have known each other for probably about uh, what, 20 plus years yeah, now. Yeah, so... kindy buddies. Kindy buddies. From the Hills <laughs> District. <laughs> and then we both went to high school together, and, and out of that, our third business partner, Nick, was down at the rival school, and somehow we befriended him. Macca and Nick live together for an exceptionally long time, and when you live together, I think one of two things happen. You either become insane geniuses, mm. or you just become insane. And one of these specific times we were talking in, in a Kiwi accent, and um, Nick gets in these philosophical mindsets, and he asked himself really, really sincerely, he asked me what would a whale feel like if it was beached? I think the natural response answer to that was, beach des, brew. Brew, you're heaps beached -y. So beached. Beached is. So we decided, let's just give animation a go. Well, you know what I do when my phone rings? Okay. Nick and Macca kind of played out this kind of little seagull whale storyline. I remember thinking it was hilarious. We improvised the whole thing and, and gave it to Jared, and the next thing we knew, he'd put it up on YouTube already as a cartoon. They've not trained in animation or anything, so the quality of the animation and the stylistic way of the, the images is not intentional. That's literally the best I can do. When we got given the opportunity of coming up with our own game, I guess that's a bit of a childhood dream. Gaming um, has been a part of my life since I gained the sense of sight. So it's been something that we hold very dear. You're a terrible gamesman, Jared. Whatever, mate. Your thumbs are like big cucumbers. <laughs> We'd spend so much time playing games on consoles like Super NES and, and Sega and even PC. But the iPhone is very, very different. We hadn't had as much experience, obviously, playing with the iPhone. One episode we thought would work really well was the final episode of season one, which had all the characters trying to pull the, the whale back into the ocean. What are you 
are you doing, bros? We've come to get you wet. We've come to get you deep beached. All right, everyone get a grip. Now pull, bros! Oh, yes. no. And the crazy crab comes along and ruins the day, and we thought that was a nice little narrative that might kind of copy across to a gaming environment really nicely. We just had to sit down and think about how the game would work and how the characters would work, and it's got to be all these things. It's got to be really quick. It's got to be easy to start straight away. It's got to be over pretty soon. You've got to want to play it a bunch of times. It's all got to be about just getting a higher score than your mate in the shortest amount of time. Jared and I being gamers, we didn't want a game that you could just end in 10 seconds. We wanted it to be challenging for ourselves. And so in developing it, we threw away the versions that came through that were just too easy to get high points. I'm still beached. I'm beached is. I suppose the success of, of Beached As and Beached Whale has, has really changed our lives. We've uh, Big time. We've got this funky little office space that we get to work in daily. We've got a, a sound studio that's made out of 300 plus custom stuffed Beached Whale toys. <laughs> we've got a, yeah, like cool little chill out games room which like we've been able to source on eBay every single games console ever made by mankind pretty much. And we've got probably the highlight of our office, which well, probably, probably the only reason why it's good to have cash. <laughs> exactly, is we uh, we spent most of it doing the engineering to build a coffee train, which uh, basically brings coffee from our kitchen through into our reception area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you have four walls and you have great floors and you have <laughs> fancy kind of thing. You have computers, but that coffee train—that's <laughs> what brings them back. It's the only reason we've managed to get another client. Exactly. Mm. We feel that we've got our fingers in these cool pies of new gaming and new platforms and, and we love to explore that. That's a real passion of Jared and I. And then hopefully, you know, with that in mind, that sort of gaming and, and hell, if, if anyone throws out, if Xbox call me tomorrow and say we want a new first person shooter uh, based on Beached As, I'll absolutely jump at the idea. I think that would be <laughs> phenomenal to, uh, you know, arm a seagull with a little Uzi. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> That's quite a Good game. It's been a tough few years for the Transformers franchise. Truly average games and horrible, horrible movies. But High Moon Studios come to the rescue with their latest game, Transformers War for Cybertron. Autobots, roll out! It's Transformers G1. Set on Cybertron before the Transformers escape to Earth, the game follows Megatron's rise to power. Lord Megatron, you're certain it's here? I am certain, Barricade. And when I find it, the balance of this war with the Autobots will finally tip in my favor. It stays true to the canon of Transformers, and your first mission is to infiltrate Starscream's base and get him to switch from being an Autobot to a Decepticon. I am Starscream, and I have protected my station for over a thousand years. The second half of the game is the Autobot campaign, and you can start with that if you want to. Autobots, engage the enemy. It covers the last stand for the Autobots on Cybertron and their escape from the dying planet. This is a prequel of sorts for the cartoons, and it does a good job of explaining how everything happened on Cybertron. And all your favourites are there, Bumblebee, Optimus Prime, Megatron, and everyone's favourite minister for fat beats, Soundwave. Autobots, how You can't blast through that shield! You cannot stop me, Autobots. Yeah, all the voices are perfect, and there's this constant stream of dialogue, which is quite clever at times, and it really stays true to the characters. The music is wonderfully robot sci-fi and the gritty imagery will also resonate for fans and bring back stacks of memories. Yeah, like that fight with Soundwave. Whenever a new guy jumped out of his chest, I was like, oh, that guy! Time to dance, Autobot! Oh, that guy! Oh, that guy with his arms! Get ready to crumble! And it just it opened the floodgates for me. Even the badges on their chest and on their arms just brought back all these childhood memories. Yeah, it's a total fan service all the way. And the game will throw these really big, huge moments at you all the way through, too, where you just go, oh! Getting excited. I can see that.
The scans indicate that a Mega Supreme's defensive barrier. I found the world pretty cold and mechanical, like it should be, you, you know, but the consequence of that is, I guess, after a long gaming session, it does get pretty hard on the eyes. Yeah, I really like the look of the game, but... You know, it's spectacular and beautiful at times, and the way that it pulls you uh, through the levels, the triggered events are quite well executed, but one negative thing I do have to say about that is the enemies tend to blend into the background because of the look of it, and that was a bit of a shame. But those flight missions, Hex, ah! Yeah, they were hectic, and there's plenty of action in this game, and it's all three-player co-op, which is great because the co-op AI is absolutely useless. They just stand around and won't help you, they don't look after you, and sometimes it feels like they don't even know that you're there. I also found the combat just a little bit simplistic. Yeah, it's kind of like Gears of War, but without a cover system, and that means most normal combat is disappointingly undemanding. You'll be walking around looking for ammo and health too much, actually, you just run out all the time. You'll be changing the old weapon, but the real challenge is finding that ammo and health, and that shouldn't be the challenge. It should be rewarding you for playing well, not for searching for scraps on the ground. And that combined with the amount of time you have to revive a teammate just makes things a bit frustrating. But the boss fights are really challenging because they're kind of like World of Warcraft boss battles where you have to follow a certain plan and I think they're the best part of the game. I just can't get past the combat though, Bajo. It just seems like it could have had so much more depth. I mean, half the weapons and abilities just felt useless. Yeah, it's real opportunity missed. And, and when you jump on the other campaign and you kind of you find you're using the same abilities and weapons as, as the Decepticons, it's just, why can't they do something slightly different, you know? It doesn't matter if it unbalances single player. It's Transformers. Just let me have fun with it. I also felt like the footprint of my Transformer felt really big, like I was in big invisible boots or something. Yeah, I kept getting knocked off ledges and, and just bumping into people with invisible walls, although it did make for some hilarious robo-trampolines. There is a patch coming which might address some of the bugs we found in the game, but probably not change anything else. I thought the parts of the game where it urges you to transform are done really well, Bajo. I mean, your brain just goes, OK, well, this is a vehicle bit, and it all just felt really natural, you know, especially for how linear the game is. And I never got sick of transforming. Yeah, me either, especially in midair. And best sci-fi bridges and doors in a game ever. Multiplayer has a bunch of familiar modes, but the added twist of being your own vehicle leads to some pretty fun tactics. A scientist class can offer air support, while the soldier class can spam areas with tank fire. And there's stealth abilities too, and as you level up, you'll unlock new vehicles and boosts to slot in. It's a really slick presentation with lots of player information and region settings. I think we had the most fun in Deathmatch. It, it does tend to suffer from that same samey feel because all the maps look the same and they're just not really big enough. But, you know, there's so many awesome parts to this game, Hex. Like the a huge robot slug escort mission, which is the best escort mission ever because you're escorting a robot slug. I just wish it had more depth. A combo system, maybe, instead of one button for slash. And, I'm struggling to score this hex because 20% of the game feels really undercooked and simple, but the other 80% is really awesome, so I think I'm just going to give it 8 out of 10 rubber chickens. If you're a fan of Transformers, you will enjoy this ride. I loved the Star Fox flying missions, and I think if the sequel was set on Earth with some core gameplay tweaks, we'd have something remarkable. The game is visually and technically super impressive, but even though it looks so good, it still felt like something was missing. It's 7.5 out of 10 from me. Now, let's move on to the Wii version of the game. Yes! One shall stand, one shall fall. It actually plays like a kind of uh, Time Crisis arcade-style shooter, but I was actually surprised to have enjoyed this so much, Bajo. Push around it! Take cover! It does mean that a lot of the freedom is taken away from you, as you don't really control your movement from area to area when everything's on rails, but rather you're in charge of rising in and out of cover, choosing the right weapon to take out enemies, or doing some quick shooting of debris when in driving or flying missions. There are crossover moments in the Autobot and Decepticon campaign. So moments uh, I had in the Autobot campaign, I'd play from uh, the other perspective in the Decepticon one. And it's all very fast paced and seamless. We played most of this game in co-op, but I gotta say, it kind of felt like an afterthought, Hex. Yeah, we had to keep swapping controllers because whoever got stuck with player two really got the raw end of the deal. You do plan on blowing that thing up, right? 
player two is basically an invisible background transformer that has one pissy gun as well as being able to fire some fairly weak missiles. Meanwhile, player one controls movement, flying and driving, cover, weapon selection, targeting and the brunt of the shooting, so it's really not that fair. Cybertron Adventures isn't long, but it looks really great, and I think what keeps it so entertaining is the pace. If you like arcade-style shooters, then there's a lot here to keep you involved with some good story, and while you're ducking in and out of cover and engaging in some pretty epic robot gunplay. I'm mainly stuck with the Gatling gun, but the sniper is good for those precise shots, allowing you to pick off enemies one at a time. I got into such a rhythm of sniping Decepticons or firing missiles at groups of Autobots, taking out security systems or navigating the alien terrain of Cybertron in a tank or in the sky when playing a Soundwave or Starscream. I'm really glad you got to play as so many of the different characters because their personalities are also distinctive, you know, and the voice acting is once again superb. Look out! There's an Autobot in here! Don't let him get to the, the thing! I think my favourite was playing as Megatron. You know, he's such a force to be reckoned with and he has those signature badass lines. You only delay the inevitable. This is the kind of game where you'll really find yourself working for those points to earn power-ups for greater weapon damage. I mean, it's nothing groundbreaking, but it's short, it's fast, and I got into it. Just remember, if you play with a friend, they're going to have to be prepared to take a back seat on this one. I'm giving the Wii version 7 out of 10 rubber chickens. It was all over a bit fast for me, Hex, so I'm giving it 6.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. Good and evil fade away. History shall judge me. Well, how did you go? Did you guess the game for this week? Oh. <laughs> Let's try something different. Never mind then. It was the acrobatic third-person shooter Wet from Naughty Bear developer Artificial Mind and Movement. Clearly they can make a decent game if they put their mind to it. Well, that's all we've got time for, but next week on the show we'll be reviewing some super sequels, the open world action of Crackdown 2, and the RPG dual matching collision that is Puzzle Quest 2. Plus, I'll be taking you on a very revealing tour of Treyarch Studios to see where they're taking the Call of Duty franchise with Black Ops. Thanks again to all the tweeters, our Facebook group, our beloved forum posters, and just a reminder that Good Game Spawn Point for younger viewers can be seen over on ABC3 at the weekends. Until next time, gamers, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo out.